Hi students, welcome to HSC Biology and Module 6, Genetic Change. This is the second video and the second in our little mini-series on mutations. In this particular video we're going to be uh, explaining how a range of mutations operate, in this case looking specifically at chemicals and how they can act as mutagens and cause mutation in the DNA. So as previously you need to make sure that you understand this term mutagen, the fact that we've now looked at a couple of different types or at least we will have by the end, so you can describe some of the different types of chemical mutagens and evaluate their impact on DNA. So what we need to do is we need to look at some of the different chemicals that can act as mutagens, that can actually cause mutation in the DNA over time. Sometimes these chemicals are uh, relatively safe in low doses or in uh, infrequent exposures, but when they're in higher concentrations or when they're being encountered over prolonged periods of time, this is the sort of thing that can increase the risk of some sort of mutation occurring. Because they're chemicals and they need to get into your cells, there needs to be some way for them to do that. So there's a couple of easy ways. We can eat them, they can be ingested, we can breathe them in, so we can get them into our lungs, and also we can absorb them directly through the skin. So there's a couple of different ways, three ways in particular, that we can look at um, for the entry of these sorts of chemicals into our bodies and specifically into cells where they can cause some damage. The reason why uh, most chemicals that are mutagenic act as mutagens is because they have some similarities in their chemical structure um, that uh, in, align with nucleotides. So either the bases themselves, and often we will, we will look at base analogs, uh, which basically means that they're in a position that they can um, do the pairing thing, do that complementary base pairing thing that we've talked about previously in the structure of DNA, but do it with the wrong chemical. And of course that is going to create mispairings that can create problems in reading the genetic code uh, in uh, polypeptide uh, synthesis and so on. Some of the most common chemical substances that can act as mutagens include asbestos, uh, certain types of dyes, nicotine, uh, benzene is a group of compounds that we don't tend to use very much anymore. They're known as the aromatic organic compounds. Uh, and benzene is that ring structure, six carbons with three double bonds scattered around. Uh, and it's a, it's, it's a particular, it, it has been uh, linked to cancer causing change in the DNA. Uh, Agent Orange may be something, uh, particularly if you do some history or if you know your history well, you might, uh, might be aware of the effects of Agent Orange. Um, nitrites, mustard gas, cigarette smoke, preservatives. There's a worrying list of chemical mutagens and a lot of different types of chemicals that can get into the cells, into the um, nucleus, and to actually make change in the DNA. And obviously this sort of stuff um, is easier to get to during times of cell replication because obviously the nuclear membrane's broken down, uh, free nucleotides are moving around in the cytoplasm, joining up as replication takes place. And so therefore, if there are any other chemicals present that shouldn't be there that might interfere with these processes, well, this is an ideal time for them to make their appearance. So what we want to do is we want to look at some of these base analogs in a little bit more detail. Now, if you're not a chemist, this is probably a scary kind of a uh, slide for you. If you are a chemist and at the possibly at this stage of your course, you may actually be starting to look through and identify some different functional groups. And if you are, great. Um, if you're not, great. What we need to do is not try and memorize any of these structures. We simply need to look at similarities. So a normal nitrogenous base would be adenine, okay? That's our A base. Make sure that A looks like an A. It's our A base. So it's got our ribose sugar on it over here, and then it's got our little nitrogenous base here, which is our A. Now, um, that's going to slot into the DNA structure, the sugar, the ribose sugar is going to link in with the phosphate strand, and then this A is going to bond to a T. And you can see that when I compare this with the base analogue, which is this one over here, this 2-amino purine nucleoside, uh, what I'm noticing is that it's attached to the same sort of sugar, 
Um, this structure here is the little sugar. That's our ribose sugar, our five carbon sugar. So uh, for the non-chemists, one carbon there, one carbon there, one carbon there, one carbon there, and another carbon there. So five sugar carbon. Uh, but then you can see here is the problem. Okay, more specifically, here is the problem. And I guess without um, under needing to understand too much about what's going on here, we've got nitrogens, we've got hydrogens, we've got oxygens, we've got carbons. They're in a particular order. They're arranged in a particular way. And that means that they will bond in a particular way. The fact that in this kind of ring structure, we have a hydrogen and a little NH2, which is called an amine group. Um, and you can see that they're basically the same ones on our actual uh, adenine base, but they're flipped. They're um, flipped back to front, if you like. They're, uh, the one that's up is down, and the one that's down is up. So there's not very much difference between these, um, just enough for this one to uh, enter into a position where an A would. So specifically, if you're looking at trying to, say, pair an A with a T, you get one of these ones jumping in. It's not going to bond exactly right because we know one of the important things about bonding is these things need to line up properly and so they don't have things in exactly the right line but they're close enough um, that that could interfere with the um, DNA molecule. The same thing is true, true in the second one. This is our guanine, our G base. Uh, and again, if you look at some of the similarities uh, in the structures that bind and try and focus on exactly what's going on that's different, and you can see that there is a little bit of a difference in what's present and what's absent in these particular uh, molecules. And that's what base analogs are about. They're about um, mimicking the structure of one of these others. Now they're chemicals, so they're not doing this deliberately. They are simply, because of their structure, able to bond in the same sort of way as other chemicals are. And, uh, and as a result of that, we don't get the right chemicals in the right place. As I said, it's not important that you um, remember each of these examples. Um, it's probably useful to have that little checklist beforehand to be able to talk about base analogs as a general thing. And the fact that these sorts of chemical substances act as mutagens because they're able to get in and change um, that DNA code. And that's our definition of a mutation and something that does that or something that causes that is our definition of a mutagen. And here's some examples of some chemicals that do that. We need to look at one more example, and that is naturally occurring mutagens, but we'll look at that in the next video. Thanks for watching.